So my channel kind of picked up with a little video I did back in May of last year, the top 10 worst FromSoft boss runbacks. I started off that video saying I was surprised that no one else had made a video about it. Why am I bringing this up? Well, today, with this run, surprisingly, I couldn't find another video where someone had already done this, and I thought this would be kind of an obvious one, to be honest. Let me explain the rules. Every boss must be killed with a boss weapon, but each boss weapon can only be used to kill one boss. That's it. The only exceptions will be the bosses I need to kill to get to the point where I can make boss weapons, but I'll cover those shortly. Every boss soul can be exchanged for something in Dark Souls 2, but it gets tricky as some of them get exchanged for spells instead of a weapon. I decided for those, I'm allowed to use the basic equipment to cast them so Sorcerer's Staff, Pyromancy Flame and Cleric Sacred Charm are allowed. Some bosses do have multiple weapons you can make from their soul, so if I do get stuck and there happens to be a boss I can cheese kill again to get their soul after a bonfire aesthetic, maybe I'll just do that. As for upgrading weapons, I'm actually not going to for the most part. Upgrading most of these weapons is tied to very rare materials, like petrified dragon bones, so unless I happen to have the materials and really need to, most of the time it's going to be a no weapon upgrades run also. Let's see how that goes. Anyway, let me know what your favourite boss weapon in Dark Souls 2 is in the comments below, and of course, hit the subscribe button if you want to support the channel. I'm just going to mention, I will do every boss in the game apart from Dark Lurker, purely because I just don't have the time to go through all of the requirements to actually get it, going and clearing out all of the enemies using effigies, etc, etc, and the spell that you get for killing him actually requires you to sacrifice some souls each time you use it, so I just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm leaving him out, I'm sorry. With that all out the way though, let's get this set up. So question for you Dark Souls 2 experts, what's the minimum number of bosses you need to kill to get a boss weapon without using glitches? Go on, I'll give you a second. The answer is two, Dragon Rider and Flexile Sentry. Now I said without glitches because technically you could execute the Pursuer skip also to make it just one, but Again, I'm trying to avoid glitches, I'm trying to do it legit, I guess. So, to get past these guys, I'm going to have to cheese them without me actually attacking. Dragon Rider, of course, just falls to his death, so no issue there. For Flexile Sentry, I let Lucatil solo it. This gives us two boss souls to start the run proper. Now we just go for a nice boat trip, grab the antiquated key, go through the door, ride in a cage, and speak to Strayed, and now things can really get interesting. Dragon Rider actually has four total weapons you can make from his soul. A halberd, a twin blade, a bow, and a great shield. I'm of course going to opt for the twin blade, but we'll save that for later. The Flexile Sentry has three weapons, the Warp Sword, Arc Sword, and Barbed Club. For our first boss to beat with a boss weapon, I'm opting for the Barbed Club. So now we can backtrack a bit and hit up the Forest of Fallen Giants. The Barbed Club is a hammer type weapon, of course dealing strike damage but it has a tasty bit of bleed there also. I've not really used bleed weapons too much in the Souls games, obviously used them loads in Elden Ring, so let's see how effective this is, and let's do the last giant. I do manage to proc bleed at one point, the damage is okay, he goes down in about 50 seconds. This weapon's not bad, it did take a lot of hits though to actually proc the bleed, and even then it wasn't a game changing amount of damage really. But then again, this weapon isn't upgraded and my stats are low, so probably it could be better at higher levels. It's also probably not a fair fight testing it against the easiest boss in the game, so what did I expect really? With our first proper boss down, we can move on to the Pursuer, and we're going to give him a taste of the last giant's power by using the giant stone axe that we got from the last giant's boss soul. This weapon, as you might imagine, is a great axe, and it's big, heavy and slow, my favourite. I struggled using this one to be honest, and I actually died to the Pursuer. The damage isn't actually even that good for how big this weapon is. The only good point is it can score some staggers on our big armoured boy. The fight was pretty slow, and honestly, I can't say I'm too impressed with this lumbering chunk of stone. Pursuer is down at least, and now I can pursue other weapon opportunities. You subscribed to the channel yet? So, remember that Dragon Rider Twin Blade from earlier? Time to put it to good use. The blade actually does magic damage as well as physical, which is pretty sweet. We're back in Hyde's Tower of Flame to take on the other boss of this area, the old Dragon Slayer. This guy is honestly pretty easy, and I did it first try. Saying that, I love this twin blade. The moveset just looks so cool, makes me feel like Darth Maul from Star Wars. My only regret is I don't have more stamina to pull off a longer combo, but I still really like it. The Dragon Slayer himself has some pretty dodgy AI at points, 
and compared to actual Ornstein, he feels like he moves in slow motion. Part of me wishes I'd maybe saved the twin blade for a different boss, but I'm glad I finally got to see the glory of Dark Souls 2 twin blades firsthand. Overall, pretty nice. Look, now I'm Dragon Slayer too. Okay, here's where things get a bit tricksy. We have the old Dragon Slayer soul, but we can't convert it into a weapon yet. For that, we need Weaponsmith Ornifix, so our next mission has to be to unlock her. We get the fan key from this mega ungrateful lion warrior, and then free our feathered friend. But before we can get to her, we've got another lot of bosses to go through. First up, Scorpionius Najka, Quelag's non-union Dark Souls 2 equivalent. We're going to make use of the Pursuer's Ultra Greatsword here. I gotta be honest, I don't really dig the Ultra Greatsword's moveset. The R1 slams in front, which means it's pretty easy to miss, and the R2, while powerful and with good range, takes way too long to execute. This fight actually took quite a while because I never wanted to risk getting more than one hit in each time. Also, she went underground quite a bit, which means I have to wait for her to resurface. I did die once or twice, but this was just more tedious than difficult, honestly. Not the worst I'm going to experience on this run, you can be sure of that. Now, there's just one more boss before Ornifex is fully available to us. But unfortunately, this is where the problem started. I decided to use my first bit of magic with Soul Shower, which I got from Najka's soul, but it turns out this is a terrible shout for Congregation. I can just about take out the Magus, but the clerics heal before I can kill them, and I easily run out of spell casts. Even using spell restoring items, it's just not enough. The damage is very low, and not all of the blasts seem to hit a lot of the time. I actually died quite a few times to Congregation, which is very embarrassing. These guys have killed me actually the most of any boss on this run so far. Wow. I've come to the conclusion that unless I do an insane amount of level grinding for intelligence stats, this just isn't going to work. So can I kill another boss to get a better weapon? My other options, unfortunately, are pretty much all gank bosses. Belfry Gargoyles, Rune Sentinels, Executioner's Chariot, Royal Rat Authority, or Skeleton Lords. There's no way this spell can handle any of those multiple enemy bosses with that much health. I actually tried the Royal Rat Vanguard, but the spell can't even kill these rats properly. It actually hits the ceiling when I try to fire it. The only one-on-one -on -one fights that I can access are Lost Sinner or the Rotten but their weapons can only be gotten from Ornifex, so I'm pretty stuck here. The only option? Bonfire Aesthetic to take out Dragon Rider again. There we go. I technically didn't use the spell here, so I can save it for another boss, I guess. As for our immediate issue, the Dragon Rider Halberd should get the job done. Thankfully, this made the Congregation fight go back to being mega easy. It didn't take long to bring them down. I can kill several at once as they tend to congregate in one place. For real though, I can't believe I died to Congregation all for 11,000 souls, but no boss soul. Is this one of the only bosses in the game that doesn't have one? Warning. Warning. Cringing coming. Okay, so this next section is called Can I beat Dark Souls 2 using freestyle? From Ornifex I got the spear of the old dragon slayer. Now finally I was ready to take on Duke's dear Freya. I was feeling pretty good, I say that with sincerity. Until I raised the spear needs 25 dexterity. I want to farm some souls, it was pretty time consuming. But another problem now was imminently looming. Turns out our dear Freya strongly resists lightning. A prospect of this was so extremely frightening. I turned tail and ran to take a different route instead. For a runback that I knew would surely make me dead. So I cheesed up this group of whipping proletariat. Now I could finally fight the executioner's chariot. I speared the skeletons and these guys who necrobants. One dead horsey later and we got the chariot lance. Okay, well, Dragon Slayer Spear was okay. I'm not sure I like spear movesets that much, to be honest. The R2 is cool, but I'm hesitant to sacrifice durability here in case of the spear breaking. Also, the damage seemed to be inconsistent at times. But at least we got this annoying boss over and done with. No more horsing around. Skeleton Lords are next on the hit list, and I was unsure how well the Chariot Lance would do here, but actually it worked a treat. The R2 charge attack knocks down the Skeleton Lords. I killed the Bone Wheel one first and then sorted out the two Bone Wheels that spawned. These guys are so weak compared to Dark Souls 1. Maybe it wasn't the best idea, but I then killed the other two lords at the same time, leading to me facing a huge army of skeletons at once. Initially, it was pretty satisfying hitting loads of them down with the R2 charge, but I soon encountered a problem. I totally forgot about the durability, and guess what? I didn't bring any repair powder. 
this could get ugly. Thanks to a bit of a miracle, I managed to kill the last skeletons with the attack that broke the lance. That is lucky AF. It's a shame I used this against the boss that can't bleed, but the charge was perfect for taking on such a big group of enemies. Let's see what we can get with the skeleton Lord Soul. I, I genuinely don't know, actually. Oh look, another halberd. The Roaring Halberd, which is our third spear halberd in a row. This one actually requires strength, dex, intelligence, and faith to wield. It does have dark damage as well as physical though, which could come in handy. I'm not going to waste this on the Covetous Demon though. Let's see if we can finally use that Soul Shower with our unupgraded Sorcerer's Staff. Even Covetous Demon took minimal damage from this attack. As well as the 5 I start with, the herbs I bought provide me with an additional 10 uses, so 15 total. Even that was not enough to bring down Covetous Demon, so I had to just hit him with the staff to take off the last bit of health. I know, I know, technically the staff isn't a boss weapon, but I don't care. This spell sucks. Let's never speak of it ever again. It's done. Over. Shut up about it. So for those keeping score, I've now got the Bone Scythe and the Roaring Halberd as available weapons to use. I think I'm going to use the Bone Scythe now for our next boss. You know what I like about this weapon? It's quick. Is the damage huge? No. But it's an unupgraded weapon made from the weakest boss in the game, so what do you expect? So, Mitha Baneful Queen. The damage is inconsistent here again. If I'm too close, the scythe does less damage, so I need to make sure I maintain a certain distance. This wasn't the most exciting fight outside of a grab attack from her which I'd never seen before. Mostly, it was just me waiting for her to attack, sometimes for quite a while. I stuck with one or two hits of the R1, or a single R2 to get my damage in. She goes down. It's not a tough boss, really. People say this is difficult. Nah, that's just a myth. Nah, not much else to say, except I think her boss weapon may come in handy for what's next. So, I started hating Iron Keep a little bit less thanks to this weapon and how good it is against the Smelter Demon. Mitha's Bent Blade has mega short range as, of course, it's a dagger, as well as low damage, but it makes up for it by inflicting toxic and poison, meaning that any boss that's vulnerable to both just has its health bar melted. I think also, since doing the blue smelter on my no leveling run, his moveset is ingrained in my brain, so dodging his attacks was an absolute breeze. I doubt this would work as well against the blue variant, as he has so much more health, but here, this was perfect. Basically, just inflict poison and toxic, run away, repeat. I even used the blade again to take down the pursuer that appears here, and the result is quite similar. Just beautiful. But the most important thing gained here is Smelty's boss soul. Time to backtrack a little. At last, we can come back to Duke's Dear Freya. This whole quest was to get a fire damage weapon, and finally we have it with the Beastly Smelter Sword. This weapon is big and slow, but deals massive damage. It takes out these little spiders in one hit, which is lovely. The only downside is that Freya's heads are surrounded by parts I can't hit, so sometimes the attacks bounce off. But otherwise, it's a pretty standard Freya fight. Just keep circling, hitting the head, repeat. I even managed to get the R2 Fire Blast in a couple times, including a finish, which of course broke the weapon. Totally worth it though, this was a long round trip to get this done, but at least we've lit a primal bonfire at last. Hooray, things are moving forward. Now, let's head back to Ornifex and... <clears throat> anyway, as I was saying, we now use Freya's soul to grab the spider fang weapon, a quick little curved sword. Gotta love these turtle guys and their easily exploitable movesets. Remember when people said Elden Ring was bad because they made enemies that have long combos with delayed gotcha attacks where you just had to wait your turn to attack? Yeah, hmm. Speaking of turn-based fights, that's exactly what this fight with Old Iron King is. Not helped by the pretty low damage this Spider Fang is doing. I actually died once because I forgot his laser beam can go through walls. How silly of me. This was, overall, another kind of boring fight. Just not even much else to say about it. He does a big slow attack, I wait for it to finish, go in, rinse and repeat. He goes down after a 6 minute fight. Hopefully something slightly more exciting next. So now we get the Iron King Hammer with the Old Iron King Soul. But the question of where to go is actually a little bit tricky here. I still need to do all the bosses in the Lost Bastille. I could go straight to the Lost Sinner, but I can't open the doors to light the arena without getting past the Rune Sentinels. But the other problem is, the Sentinel's boss soul yields a spell which requires 35 intelligence to use, which I do not yet have. I'm trying not to respec unless I absolutely need to. Other bosses I could tackle right now are Royal Rat Authority, Royal Rat Vanguard, and the Rotten. Royal Rat Authority, I might have to leave till last, because its boss soul gives a pyromancy which does no damage. Great. So that leaves Royal Rat Vanguard or the Rotten. Vanguard gives me Toxic Mist, which I feel will be better against the Ruined Sentinels than the Rotten, so let's do the Rotten first. This fight 
it's not an issue. The hammer does a nice chunk of damage, and actually it can still cut off the Rotten's arm somehow. The Rotten goes down without too much challenge, which is good. I'd score this guy a raw 10 out of 10. You know what that means? It's butcher knife time! Seriously, on effects, why do you have to live in such a dangerous area? Fighting these rats with the butcher knife goes exactly how you expect. By which I mean I die the first time because I got careless, but then come back and slaughter these guys with ease. I feel like the butcher knife health regeneration is much more evident in Dark Souls 2 than the other games. Handy. I guess it's time to get some toxic mist on the go. Turns out, toxic absolutely ruins these sentinels. One cast is enough to proc, and one lot of toxic takes off about 70% of their health. Needless to say, this is pretty easy. Proc the toxic, and run away. One of the casts even managed to get two of them at the same time. I didn't even need to use many spare restoring items, which was great. I had fun doing this. Definitely a different way to fight than I'm used to, but pretty satisfying kind of cheesing these idiots. But guess what though? I still don't have enough intelligence for their heavy homing soul arrow spell. Thankfully, I had some simpleton spice and just enough to make it work. So, where next? Well, it's either Lost Sinner or Belfry Gargoyles. I opted for the Lost Sinner, as I think this slow moving magic spell will be more difficult to use against a gank fight. So far, I feel good about this choice. This spell is much better than that Soul Shower spell from earlier. It actually trivializes this fight. The only danger is finding time to take the spell restoring items, as my adaptability is pretty low still. But other than that, it's just a matter of waiting for her to attack, using the spell, running away, rinse and repeat. It's a slow fight as the damage is okay, but not great. Overall though, Lost Sinner goes down without too much trouble. I think this is the first time I've ever done the Lost Sinner last out of the four Great Souls. We've still got the Gargoyles to do, but I've decided I'm going to come back to them later. Don't worry, they'll get done, eventually. Anyway, so let's get on to Drang Lake Castle. Good thing I've got these four Great Souls now, otherwise I might have had to climb over this small pile of rubble. Twin Dragon Riders. I mean, it's not very difficult, I got this done first try. The Lost Sinner's Sword is pretty similar to the Pursuer's Ultra Great Sword, really. I'm not sure if there's even any difference in the moveset. Nothing much else to really say about this weapon or boss, probably the most boring one so far, but it now puts me in an interesting position. I've already used the Dragon Rider Halberd and the Dragon Rider Twin Blade, which means I've got to use the Dragon Rider Bow to tackle the next boss. This is going to be interesting. I'll say it again. It's amazing how much range really trivializes bosses a lot of the time. The damage wasn't amazing. I used magic arrows to try to optimize, but as long as I kept my distance, this was no issue at all. It did take a while, especially as towards the end of the fight, he decided to start keeping his shield up more. But after about 60-ish arrows and killing three NPC summons from him, I managed to go through the looking glass. Night. So, now we get to use his Thorn Greatsword, a lightning weapon. And what's weak to lightning? The Belfry Gargoyles, of course. This is what I was waiting for. The R2 when two-handed also fires out a lightning projectile which can come in handy. This fight was another long one, a lot of running away, getting a couple shots in, running away again, and so on, until it brings them down. It's amazing how much the difficulty of this fight can vary depending on the weapon you use. I'm just glad it's over. Probably one of my least favourite bosses in the game. At least we get a nice spear, the Gargoyle's Bident. After a quick stop through the best area in the game, we can take on the Demon of Song. The Bident is fast enough to sometimes get 3-4 to four hits in while the Demon is vulnerable, so as you imagine, this wasn't very difficult. Quite like this Bident though, good damage and good range. So what do we get for killing this froggy boy? The Spotted Whip. Oh boy. The damage from this thing is pretty terrible. Look how much it does to these Basilisks who have pretty weak defences generally. The attacks are pretty slow as well. The only redeeming feature is that it has poison infusion and also the range isn't bad. Maybe this won't be so bad. Velstad, he's our next boss. The damage is, yeah, wow. That's the worst damage of the run so far. I feel like I whipped him quite a few times here, but the poison didn't prop. Checking on the wiki right now. Okay, that's not good. At least he's not immune, but proccing the poison takes a lot of hits, and even when it does proc, it doesn't take off that much health. This was actually difficult. The fight took forever. At least Dark Souls 2 doesn't have any of those delayed gotcha attacks Elden Ring introduced, or this would have been much harder. The second phase was actually easier, because he leaves himself vulnerable for a whipping when he does the projectile attack. 
Normally, he takes half damage, but because we only want to proc the poison anyway, the damage reduction doesn't really affect us here. Finally, after a lot of dodging and waiting, the poison kills off Velstad. This was probably the first actually difficult boss, ignoring the congregation nonsense from earlier. Of course, we now get a big chonk weapon, Velstad's Sacred Chime. This thing does dark damage and is huge. The R2 fires off dark projectiles, but I find the angle of this attack really awkward, and it never seems to do that much to justify the durability loss. Anyway, it's only Guardian Dragon next. The hammer does a nice chunk of damage with each hit. It's nice to see this after using that spotted whip. The Guardian Dragon, he, I mean he's pretty easy, you know this. This is a first try success as you might imagine. No issues here really apart from taking damage messing around trying to hit his tail. Now there's actually two weapons we can get with his soul. I was tempted to get the Spitfire Spear because I haven't used it before and it does some nice fire damage, but then I remembered who the next boss is and decided to opt for the Drakewing Ultra Greatsword. Just got to get through this awesome area first. Good thing I bought this fragrant branch of yore, or I might have had to try and squeeze through this space that's almost the same size as my body. So, Ancient Dragon. Honestly, I feel bad because it almost seems like a waste to use this awesome Drake Wing Ultra Greatsword on him. At least the damage should be... Oh, okay. Well, at least I'll probably do it first, try and get it over with... Oh. So on the second go, I use the tried and tested toe method. As such, the fight is a very boring trivial affair as this boss always is these days. At least the durability on this weapon is quite good, so I don't have to faff with repair powder too much. So he goes down, but wait, no boss soul? Oh yeah, that's right, we've got to go into that memory to grab it. With it, we can get the Curved Dragon Greatsword. Well, this part of any Dark Souls 2 run is basically several bosses in a row with limited movesets and large health bars. We had Ancient Dragon, and now we have Giant Lord. This guy looks epic, but you basically never see anything but his ankles if you're a melee character. I'd really like to say more about this fight, but I mean, it's, it's, it's Giant Lord. You, you know what it is. The Curved Dragon Greatsword at least does good damage, so this doesn't drag out too long. I prefer the moveset of this to some of the other Greatswords I've used so far. And speaking of swords, I wager we're getting another one here. Let's have a look. Wait, wait what? Repel? The Giant Lord Soul gives us Repel? A spell that doesn't do any damage. Fantastic. Well, there's only one thing for it. I kind of feel sorry for this guy, you know. But thankfully, he has one weapon I can still use, the Dragon Rider Great Shield. But this means I either have to kill Vendrick or the Throne Watcher duo with a Great Shield. I'm thinking Vendrick is the better option, but this is still going to absolutely suck. I'm dreading the damage here. Well, let's see what we're... Wait, what, what's he doing? Did he just throw a projectile? When did Vendrick get a projectile attack? I've literally never seen that before. Anyway, the damage is about what you'd expect. Luckily, it's Vendrick, so the only real danger is me getting impatient and making a mistake. Obviously, I would never do that. I rarely ever went for more than one hit here. The shield attack is too slow, and Vendrick does a ton of damage, so better to be safe than sorry. But there we go, he's down. By the way, let me know if you want me to upload any of the full fights. Maybe you're the kind of person who wants to see the full glory of Vendrick being beaten with an unupgraded Great Shield. But also, no soul here. We gotta go grab it from Shrine of Amana. So happy to be back. Anyway, soul get, and now we got two choices. Ruler's Sword or King's Ultra Great Sword. Ruler's Sword's power, from what I understand, is dependent on how many souls you're carrying, which doesn't seem like a great option for now, so I went for the King's Ultra Great Sword. It's not even really a sword, it's like a huge statue on the end of a stick. So it's Throne Watcher and Defender as our next boss, and I'm kind of regretting this weapon choice. The weight of this weapon is insane. It's pushed me all the way up to fat rolling. Fat rolling in Elden Ring was bad enough, but combined here with the slow swings of this weapon, and it feels like I'm moving through warm porridge. This boss is normally kind of tough anyway, but here one mistimed swing means death. In the end, I push through, managing to defeat Throne Watcher in a totally legit and not in any way cheesy fashion, and then bringing down Throne Defender afterwards thanks to his fairly bad AI. The great thing with this boss fight is that it gives two boss souls and thus two boss weapons. The Chandra comes in right away after defeating them, but as per the rules of this run, I can't beat her using this weapon. And to be honest, I don't want to. This weapon would probably need a lot of vitality investment to be worthwhile, but yeah, way too slow for me even if the damage is good. Let's go get those other boss weapons. The Watcher Greatsword does magic damage and the Defender Greatsword does lightning damage, and both have the ability to buff the weapon for 45 seconds with their chosen element. 
The Chandra is weak to lightning apparently, so that's what I'll go with first, the Defender Greatsword. The Chandra is pretty easy as per usual. As long as you keep popping life gems and stay close, most of the attacks aren't too tough to avoid. The lightning buff with this sword is actually pretty great, it increases our damage by about 75%. This was much more satisfying than the last weapon for sure. Aldia of course pops up right away, but I can't fight him yet. What should I use I wonder? Well, I grabbed Nishandra's scythe because I just gotta use it, but not for Aldia. He's weak to magic apparently, so watch a great sword it is. Now a while back, I made a video listing my least favourite bosses in the series, and I put Aldia in that list. Many people disagreed because of his character and the lore behind him. While I agree that the lore is cool and he is a pretty decent character with some nice dialogue, I just can't look past how boring this boss fight is. There's big periods of time where you just stand around and wait, sometimes for nearly 30 seconds or more, for a 3 second window to attack. I didn't even want to risk buffing the weapon in this fight because there's such long periods where I just can't attack him. Overall, it's not like it's difficult, I did it first try, it's just a matter of patience. The Watcher Greatsword did adequate damage, it's a shame it just wasn't really the best fight to try this buff. Anyway, the base game is complete outside of Raw Rat Authority, but we'll save that ball of joy until a bit later on. So we're on to the DLC. But the question is, who do I fight first? Well, we're going to be using the Chandra's Scythe, which does dark damage. From looking at the DLC bosses, there's only one of them which is weak to dark. Do you know what I'm talking about? Blue Smelter Demon, of course! Yep, that's right, this is how we're starting the DLC. It's kind of a weird one, because I did this guy on SL1 last year. I've obviously got way more health and adaptability than back then, but I do less damage because my weapon isn't upgraded and does slash instead of strike damage. Overall, this isn't too bad. I said it before with the other Smelter Demon, but the moveset of this boss is just ingrained in me now, so although this fight takes a while, I don't struggle too much, and Cool Ranch goes down. Pretty happy to tick off one of the harder bosses right off the bat. Of course, we get the Age Smelter Sword, a big magic damage beast, but who to use it on? Our next stop is down to the Sunken Crown DLC. I decided to make use of this spinning top to determine which boss I should face next, and it landed on Ilana. This boss is weak to magic, which is great, but this boss is also always trouble. Our Cool Ranch Blade does decent damage, but if she summons Velstad, it often ends up being a long game of baiting him away, running him for one attack, and then running away again. It's also a common misconception with this boss that she won't summon again if there's a summon already in play, but here is definitive proof that is not the case. In the end, I beat her the same way that I always do. I got lucky and she summoned the pigs. It's crazy how much RNG determines the difficulty of this fight, but at least it's done. So let's go grab her weapon, the Wrathful Axe. I decided the best bet would be Fume Knight, and you know what? This damage is actually pretty good, probably some of the better damage we've seen in a while. I opted not to do the second phase skip cheese and kill him legit this time, and it wasn't actually too bad. Even the second phase attacks like the explosion or the big sweep didn't nuke my health. I managed to dodge or survive most of these attacks and then he felt my wrath. Seriously, it took me about 5 tries. He must be fuming after this. Nice weapon though. The 30 faith requirement for this axe is a bit random, but it seems worth a shot from my experience with it here. So obviously, we got to get Fume Knight's Mega Chonk Sword. We're going to finish up the Iron King DLC by doing Sir Alon. Seriously, why is he always just sitting here alone in this room? There's a reason we're doing him next, but we'll come back to that. The Fume Knight Ultra Greatsword does great damage, as one might imagine. I only go for one shot at a time as it's pretty slow, but I managed to get some R2s in there for extra damage. This wasn't so bad, apart from having to farm the enemies beforehand into non-existence. Seriously, what a brutal run back. After some well-timed smacks and a pretty good final R2, Sir Alon is down, and we can finish up the Old Iron King DLC. Now why was I keen to do Sir Alon here? Well, this DLC actually gives us a fourth boss soul by collecting all the Nadalia soul fragments, and the last smelter wedge I need to do this is behind Sir Alon. So now we can also grab this pyromancy called Outcry, as well as of course the Bewitched Alon sword from Alon's soul. Always good to have some options. I thought this pyromancy was going to be awesome against Arva, but yeah. Anyway, 
I decided to go try a longsword against Sin instead. On paper, you'd think this would actually be a pretty bad matchup, given that Katanas have pretty low durability and Sin's gimmick is murdering your durability with his skin. I mean, you can literally see the meter go down loads with each hit. Luckily, I had my repair powder equipped in my shortcuts in advance and I definitely didn't have to fumble to do this mid-fight. Sin is another boss whose moves are burned into my brain after the SL1 run, so I actually just did this first try, which I was very surprised by. Not too shabby. I did the buff with the sword once at the beginning of the fight. The damage was good, but I just didn't want to risk using more durability, so I stuck with normal attacks throughout. What sinful behaviour. Anyway, now we can get Sin's weapon, Yorg Spear. This thing is crazy long. But before we get onto that, I was trying to think where we would be best to use that outcry pyromancy, and then I remembered that the Royal Rat Authority is still in play. It actually worked a treat for getting rid of the smaller rats right off the bat, although one survived with a tiny bit of health which was annoying. To my surprise though, the big guy actually took it out, I didn't know he could do friendly fire. Outcry did some good damage against him here. The only awkward part was that it only has one cast, so every time I use it I have to munch a herb. I'm so glad that this guy was still here as I don't think any of the other remaining bosses could have been taken out by Outcry. That's the only time you'll ever hear me be thankful for this boss's existence. His soul gives a pyromancy that decrades equipment, but it doesn't do any damage whatsoever, so in PvE it's absolutely useless. Right, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Just to recap, we've got Gank Squad, Arva, Ivory King and Ludin Zalem remaining to close out the DLC. Gank Squad doesn't drop a weapon, so I can't touch that yet. Ivory King and the Tiger Bros can't be accessed until I beat Arva, so our next destination is very clear. Often the thing I don't like with spears is the poke move sets where it's easy to miss the target. York Spear though has a pretty different approach. It has some wide swings, and because of how large the weapon is, it doesn't often miss. My favourite here might actually be the attack after you dodge. I basically could roll into almost all of Arva's attacks and then execute this to guarantee a hit. That damage is nothing to sniff at either. I also made use of the R2 from time to time and the crazy looking R1 R1 combo. The only thing that slowed us down was the durability running out at one point, but other than that, this Arva fight wasn't too bad. Love this spear. For this fight it was perfect. So with Arva's soul, we get the ivory straight sword. Apparently this does strike damage, it's a bit weird. Wait, it's this tiny little thing? What the hell? Ah, spiders! Oh my god! Wow, it's a freaking lightsaber. This thing looks awesome! Right, well, shall we just get the worst part out of the way? Let's get Ludens Allen done. After managing to make it there first time without dying at all... Okay, second time. This is the only time I'm going to do this, but I'm actually going to make a save state here to avoid having to do that again. Ah, Rudolph! So weirdly, this was tougher than when I fought these guys on SL1. I think the problem is the weapon doesn't do much damage with its light attacks. The heavy attack though does an excellent amount of damage, but it takes a while to charge, plus takes a chunk of durability. I mean, really the only difficult bit with this fight is when both tigers are in play. Once you're down to just one, it's more or less in the bag. I think I might be catatonic from doing this area so many times, but I sort of enjoyed this. I've got the tiger's movesets down, so it wasn't so bad. I'm probably not going to do any runs that take me through here again in a while though. These tigers can do one. But we do actually get two souls for beating them, so there is one positive there. The Loose Greatsword and the Loose Shield can be acquired. The shield is pretty cool as it slowly regens your health, so good to keep on the back. The defense stats aren't great, so I'm not going to try using it for blocking. There is one other boss weapon we can get though before fighting the Ivory King. The Ilium Lois Curve Sword can be gotten from Alsana's Soul. You can get this by bringing her 50 Lois Souls, which you can get by farming the charred Lois Knights in the Ivory King boss room, or... Yeah, so anyway, I'm going to use this sword because it's a bit faster and it looks cool. This, actually, was the toughest fight so far. I don't know why, but I always really struggle with this one. I ended up respecting for more decks and even changing my armor for the first time on this run to get more defense. To be fair, there wasn't a rule against me changing the armor, I was just trying to be stylish. The first part of the battle is pretty cool in terms of it's an all out war between your army and their army, but it does get kind of tedious doing it over and over again when I just want to fight the Ivory King. Well, let me show you how this went.
such triumph. And with that, the run is comp Wait, I forgot the gank squad. Well, I suppose it's a good chance to test out the best DLC boss weapon against the best DLC boss in Dark Souls 2. I prefer the real. Best DLC boss. I said the real. Best DLC boss. Perfection. The Ivory King Ultra Greatsword is a massive beam sword. Will that make this fight any more fun and less tedious? I mean, a little bit, but mainly because I do decent damage now. It's still the same thing though, lots of running away, taking them out one by one. Did have a nice finish there though. So there we have it ladies and gentlemen. Boss weapons only, a different boss weapon for each boss, no weapon upgrades. Pretty fun actually. My favourite challenge runs are ones where I get to try out a lot of new weapons and that definitely ticked this box. If you like this video and want to see more, hit me up with a tasty subscribe and join the community. I really hope you did enjoy this. I'll be doing an Elden Ring challenge run next, so look out for that one. Until then, see you next time, and have a good one.